Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Money Show Money Masters podcast. I'm Mike Larson, Editor-in-Chief at Money Show, and I'm coming to you from the Investment Masters Symposium in Las Vegas. Today, I'm extraordinarily happy to have the opportunity to sit down with Charles Payne, host of Fox's Making Money with Charles Payne. Charles, thank you so much for your time today. It's great to be here, Mike. Thanks a lot. Charles, many of our attendees here and listeners to this podcast have read your 2007 book, Be Smart, Act Fast, Get Rich. They've read your 2019 book, Unstoppable Prosperity. And now you've just announced the title of your new book, Unbreakable Investor. What is your message in this book? What are readers of this going to learn? Well, if you go back to Unstoppable Prosperity, the idea was investing in the stock market. It is an amazing, I call it the greatest money-making machine in history. It's, sure. it's, it's better than anything out there. And the most beautiful part about it is anyone could participate. But a lot of folks came into the stock market uh, right around the time the book came out, yeah. and particularly during COVID. Uh, people were in their homes. And there was sort of a general epiphany about life. And, and I think people wanted greater control over every aspect of their lives, including financial. For sure. So we had this big onslaught of folks who came into the market. I call it the new investor revolution. Okay. And initially it felt good, right? You had folks on social media saying it was easy. <laughs> that stocks only go up. <laughs> right, so, so what I wanted to do is sort of follow that up because yeah, it's the greatest money-making machine in history, but you've got to have certain things to make you a, quote, unbreakable investor. Yep. And that's, so it's a great companion book with the uh, unstoppable prosperity. Got it. Now, you've been investing personally for decades. You've been writing and talking about the markets for many, many years. What do you see different in this environment that today's investor needs to know versus maybe when you wrote your last book or the one before that? Well, information overload, I think, is big. Um, you got a lot of people with a lot of ideas coming at you. Uh, financial media, social media, uh, you know, going back in the day, it was the water cooler thing, <laughs> right? Uh, you might get a tip at, at work from a buddy who knows someone who knows someone. Yep. Uh, and so there's a lot of noise to filter out. And all the noise comes with its own, uh, everyone's got an ax to grind. So it, it's even harder now to find something that's genuine, organic, uh, without sort of trying to uh, find a, 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 a message, without yep. some sort of pre preordained or preconceived message and it's not easy it's not easy and, and, and so the irony is is that despite the fact that there's more information it may be in part because there's more information yeah. out there the more folks need to know how to be able to make these decisions on their own absolutely now your topic here your keynote was on the roaring 2020s um, can you summarize for our listeners what the theme is there you know what do you see about this environment that's somewhat similar to what happened in the 1920s it's so uncanny it really is so uncanny so you think about the the 1920s coming out of the spanish war uh, we had the war on terror essentially you know mostly won that war uh, they had of course the um, the, the, a, pand a pandemic then, back then, uh, we've had, we had COVID. Uh, we went from a, a, a sort of pro-business era to a, to a government that wasn't pro-business. And what happened was, uh, is we've had this great recession. By the way, the recess, there was a recession, it was short, uh, going into the 2020s. That yep. was the harshest recession uh, of the decade, of the century rather, until the Great Depression. Sure. So we had the same economic backdrop, we had the same sort of, uh, with this once in a century uh, pandemic, uh, we had coming out of a, a wartime into peacetime, and this sort of need or desire for prosperity. Also what we had uh, back then that's very similar to now is just an explosion uh, of opportunity, an explosion of technology. Back then it was the wireless, yep. also known as the radio. Uh, you know, the first radio broadcast happened in the 1920s. Uh, electricity, uh, the automobile became ubiquitous. Uh, these are things that people can aim for. Regular folks just uh, 10 years earlier could never conceive of it. And then it was when, within the grasp of people. Yeah. And the idea, hey, I can piggyback off that also and maybe find ways of, of generating personal wealth, personal prosperity. Got it. And you also mentioned the concept of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which obviously is a lot different from the ones that came before it. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Sure. I mean, think about the, uh, you know, going back to the uh, machines that helped uh, humans do menial tasks. Uh, you know, the first, of course, maybe the most famous would be the weaving machine, uh, where you might have needed 20 folks who would get together and weave something together and then one machine could do it and uh, it scared the hell out of society. Ned Ludd, I, by the way, when we get the term Luddite from, I consider yep. myself a Luddite, someone <laughs> who's intimidated by technology uh, uh, and always kind of worries, you know, what, does it, what will the actual impact be on, on, on humankind? 
We go from that, you go to the railroads, which connected everyone. Then you fast forward to the PC revolution, the computer revolution, uh, combined with World Wide Web, and, and, and just, it, it opened the world up to everyone. And each one of these uh, created amazing economic opportunities, but also, also huge, huge uh, economic disasters. Yeah. We, have four, we have four panics in the 1800s, and, almost, and all of them revolved around railroads. I mean, you think about it, when the railroad was coming up, it seems like, oh, easy. We're going to crisscross the country with this new thing that will connect America and eventually connect the world. But there were so many of them. Yep. The automobile, there were 300 automobile companies. They had to fight that out. <laughs> so some didn't make it. That means the investors didn't make it. Right? We go from 300 to three, in yep. fact, most didn't Absolutely. make it. Absolutely. Uh, same thing. Think about, for people who are old enough to remember, the PC revolution. Where's Compact right now? Where's Lucent right now? And even some of the names that did well, IBM, that stock has never recovered. Right? Yeah. So Cisco has never recovered. That was the, that was the poster child of that era. Uh, and so, so it's important to know that the opportunities in this fourth industrial revolution, we already know the AI part of it, but it will, yeah. it will be absolutely amazing. And by the way, it's going to be not just technology as we think about it. It will be in farming. It will be in medicine. Uh, it will be in so many different areas. Uh, that will have an amazing positive impact on, on the human experience, create trillions and trillions of dollars in wealth, and we want a piece of that action. Absolutely. But you've got to understand, uh, you know, it's, everything that says AI, just like everything <laughs> that once said dot com, may not be a great investment. I remember you had a quote something like, there's going to be so many ways to make a lot of money as well as so many ways to lose a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's great advice. Let me just pivot a little bit to the market environment while we have a few minutes left. Um, the recent Fitch warning, a lot of people here were talking about the U.S. and the debt situation, fiscal deterioration and so right. on. Now, how concerning is that for investors? What do they have to think about that? It's concerning. Um, I think there's two ways of looking at it, right? Because uh, in, in 2008, 2009, uh, you know, we had a, a, the, the, uh, general, the global financial crisis, uh, the, the housing implosion in this country, and people became more fiscally aware. If you would look at polls, uh, all of a sudden the economy you know, catapulted back to the number one worry and concerns. And yeah. with that came the debt concerns. And we were worried about going off that fiscal cliff, that debt cliff. Because we didn't go off of it, I don't think people are paying attention as much as they once did. Yeah. Uh, but at some point, you do go off the cliff. Here's the thing, you don't give, you know, there's no coming back. Once you go off, you go <laughs> off. So investors have to be aware of it. I don't know where the ultimate, you know, peak is. And I don't think anyone really does. But by the same token, it is an expensive proposition. Now yeah. our government's spending a trillion dollars just to service that debt. And now, uh, you know, household, Debt to servicing ratios are going up. Uh, credit card interest rates are 22%. Auto loan uh, interest rates are at the highest level in about 17 years. And by the way, auto loans just passed student loans. <laughs> $1.58 trillion versus $1.57 trillion. So these are all potential ticking time bombs that yeah. we have to be aware of. It's like an auto loan payment today is almost like a mortgage payment a generation it's, it's, ago. It's, it's nuts. I mean, the average <laughs> car payment, I think, is 750 bucks. Maybe 25% of all new car loans are over $1,000. $1,000 for a car? I mean, that's just, <laughs> I mean, and that's just unthinkable. Just maybe four or five years yep. ago, you couldn't even told, you could not have suggested that. And, and here we are. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you mentioned interest rates. That was obviously a big topic. You, you hosted a panel that was focused on the Fed. Is, are they going to pivot? Are they not? I mean, what's the outlook there? What do you see happening? You know, that's there? probably, a, that panel was fantastic. And what I love about it is that there's so many smart people with so many different opinions <laughs> on this. And what we're trying to do really is we're trying to game the thinking of Jay Powell. Now he's invoked Paul Volcker a lot. Uh, yeah. You know, in fact, uh, a couple of years ago he was in the Senate and Rich, uh, uh, Senator Richard Sherman, uh, Rich, is it Sherman, the Alabama? He, uh, he kind of challenged Shelby? him. Shelby? Shelby, yeah. I'm sorry, Shelby, yeah. thanks. Yeah, Shelby. So he kind of like, you know, I, I knew Paul Volcker, you know Paul Volcker <laughs> kind of thing, yep. and really, really uh, embarrassed him. And so I think he's been trying to prove that he's got the, you know, he could be Paul Volcker after blowing the trans, transit, uh, transitory inflation call. So Jay Powell's in a, in a real serious predicament. This Fed is in a serious predicament. They know they have the ability to push this economy over the edge and that they could say we had to do it, you know, it was a better part of valor. Yep. I think though, they would love to be able to say they engineered a soft landing. Uh, and so with that comes the risk of waiting too long or, you know, pausing too long and then here comes that lag effect. Yeah. Um, 
I, I would like to see Powell hold off. Uh, I would like to see the lag effect do its work. I'd like to see him be truly data dependent, but also go beyond government data. Yeah. You know? yeah. The JOLTS report says there's almost 10 million jobs out there. ZipRecruiter comes out two weeks later with the earnings report and says, listen, no one's paying, paying up. No one's paying up. So uh, it, there's a lot of data out there. And if we just go by government data, yeah, I would say one or two more rate hikes. But I think if you go straight to businesses and listen to what they're saying, straight to consumer and, consumers and listen to what they're saying, they would be better to pause. Okay. One last question, I guess, would be, you know, greatest opportunity and greatest risk in this market. I think you talked about companies that are implementing AI and the productivity that comes with that might be on the opportunity side. I was wondering if you just, you know, briefly talk on that. Yeah, I mean, AI is a tool. Uh, artificial intelligence is a tool and it's going to allow companies that know how to use it best. You know, it's like a basketball. Yeah, yeah. There are certain people who make $40 million a year with a basketball. <laughs> I could make $4 a year with it. <laughs> Doing tricks in Times yeah. Square, trying, right? Uh, and, and so it's a tool. And the, and the companies that know how to, you know, that become the Michael Jordans of AI are the ones that are going to truly, truly benefit. It's going to be initially harder to sniff them out. Yep. But you'll see earnings reports will come out. We'll see their productivity. The margins are going to expand. R&D is where I'm also going to be looking at. R&D speeds up. How much, how much quicker have they been able to speed up their research and development yep. and bring things to fruition? From the, from the idea to the draw, drawing boards, out to the public, you know? So I think those are going to be the big, big, big winners with respect to AI. You'll get the companies that are the picks and shovels, so the NVIDIAs of the world, yep. yes. But there are going to be companies that do things with those picks and shovels that we're going to want to be uh, owners of those stocks. Okay. Well, Charles, you know everybody here has, has uh, been very ecstatic about you being here to talk and educate, help educate investors. Thank you very much for your Thank efforts you. and best of luck with Unbreakable Investor. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you.